ready to yes. start. Okay. Good afternoon uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'm, I'm in fact, you know, like um, I'm, uh, this webinar, we, we're bringing you live from, uh, from Paris and uh, there are lots of panelists in different parts of the world. So please bear with me. There may be, you know, some uh, uh, connection problem or connection issues, but, you know, we'll try to uh, get over them. Um, this uh, this is the first in, in, in a series of webinars that we will be organizing from now until the 22nd of, uh, of June. So I hope uh, all of you will attend uh, the other um, episode in this series. Um, I will now start. Accurate information about climate change is vital to convince decision makers of its significant impact and the urgent access needed to develop measures for mitigation. Yet disinformation, meaning falsehood uh, designed to undermine the validity of scientific evidence, permeates the sphere of climate change knowledge exchange processes. Such false information may delay and even hinder urgent um, efforts to respond to climate change. It is thus crucial that these questions are addressed uh, to its entirety. Following the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been a renewed attention on information, uh, informational problems. Uh, parallels can be drawn uh, with, uh, with what is happening in, in, in COVID uh, pandemic uh, with informational problem in it that is happening in, in the sphere of climate change. Today's webinar is first in this series that will explore false information about climate change and analyze their implications. The first uh, webinar that is today will uh, explore perspectives on combating false information proliferation within the broader context of climate change. The second webinar uh, to be held on 17th June will focus on the issue of communicating science to the public and explore it from uh, the point of view of, uh, of, of demand side. The third uh, webinar uh, will be on uh, will be held on 19th of June, and it will explore um, uh, it will explore the supply side of uh, of the fall flow of uh, false information. And the, and the final say, webinar will be held on 22nd of June, and it will be on convergence and address concrete strategy for beyond confusion and and, and inspire a few accents. In I'm sure. These webinars will take stock of recent developments in the area and illustrate the best practices and existing solutions that can tackle informational issues surrounding climate change. Additionally, we hope to obtain support for and feedback on platforms and action that, uh, that uh, raise awareness of climate change and address the proliferation of false information. The, this activity is in line with, uh, with the communication and information sectors mandate to promote universal access to information and also the natural sciences, uh, science, science sectors are mandated to create knowledge and understanding to achieve sustainable development and greener societies. The, this activity is also in sync with UNESCO's overall strategy on climate change approved by UNESCO's uh, member states in, in, in uh, 38th session of uh, the general conference. During this first webinar, we will uh, discuss uh, the phenomena of false information in the realm of climate change and, and the negative effects uh, this may cause. Allow me to invite um, ADGCI, Dr. Moise uh, Chakchuk, uh, who is here with us, to give his opening remarks. Dr. Chokchuk is the uh, UNESCO's uh, Assistant Director General for Communication and Information. Since May uh, 2018, he is responsible for the organization's uh, program on fostering freedom of expression and building inclusive knowledge societies. Dr. Chokchuk, the floor is yours. Thank you, Banu. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good morning, everyone, for some people who are still uh, in, 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 the, in the U.S. Um, and from the West. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to open this online uh, discussion on climate change disinformation and uh, I would like to thank our panelists uh, for participating in this important and uh, topical discussion, as well as the IPS Academy and, Citiz and Citizens Platform for joining forces with UNESCO to organize this webinar series. We convene today in exceptional times as uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has transformed the ways that we live, work, 
and interact with one another. While the consequences of the crisis itself have been dramatic, the pandemic has been further compounded by an infodemic. The spread of misinformation and disinformation about the virus not only represents a major threat in terms of health and safety, but it also uh, complicates the responses developed by different actors to mitigate the crisis. In that sense, the challenge of the infodemic echoes that uh, of disinformation about uh, climate change, the theme of today's event. From recent swarms and the locusts defavoring crops in Africa, to uh, bushfires in uh, Australia and cyclones in Asia, the devastating effects of climate change on our lives are more visible than ever in all regions of the world. And yet, false information about climate change persists, downplaying the severity of this phenomenon and sometimes preventing access to accurate information with a potentially devastating effects. It risks, it, it risks driving uh, politicization and polarization at a moment when the world needs unity and mutual support more than ever. To rise to the challenge of uh, this and misinformation, we need independent quality journalism, which can provide reliable information. Media has an, an essential role to play to help citizens understand complex issues such as climate change. And it has uh, the difficult but uh, uh, important task of bringing verified information from verified and reliable information from a multitude of disciplines working on climate change issues to, the, to its audience. Simultaneously, it needs to present its coverage through stories that demonstrates both the urgent of the situation, the urgency of the situation, but also inspire change and hope through showcasing possible solutions. Access to scientific information is equally important to help understand and explain these issues and to find effective solutions to address them. We must also strengthen citizens' skills to identify and correct information and prevent its proliferation online and offline. And this includes, of course, rumors. Currently, we must address both the sources and the recipients of of false information. The sources of information should be free of bias and uh, falsehoods uh, through transparency norms, regulation, and, technolo and technological solutions, and promote the production and dissemination of verified information and reliable sources. On the other hand, we have to work with the recipients of information and enhance their capacities to isolate truth and from fiction and provide them with fact-checking services and skills. To this end, media and information literacy is a crucial tool for building the necessary digital and critical capacities. It is in this perspective that UNESCO's response to this challenge, or to this challenge lies following a holistic approach. Our organization is committed to providing societies with the tools necessary to raise awareness among all and to strengthen our society's resilience in the face of disinformation. This has been our approach to respond to the infodemic around the COVID-19, from which we, can le we, we learned a lot, as it has further highlighted the role of accurate information in informing effective policy responses and encouraging the public to take the right action and of, in times of crisis. Be they health crises or environmental ones, it's the same. In recognition of, this, uh, of, the, importance, of the importance of these issues of climate change and uh, false information and the intersection between them, UNESCO has initiated several projects, including journalism handbooks that educate media professionals, also published the handbook of journalism, fake news and disinformation, which provides training for journalists and other stakeholders on addressing false information. To empower citizens, and in particular youth, our um, Milk Leaks initiative uses social media to raise awareness about media and information literacy, 
and to debunk false information, including about climate change. In our response, we also strive to promote interdisciplinarity and multi-stakeholder exchanges on how to address these issues by involving actors in the spheres of education, science, culture, and information, as they are all impacted by the effects of climate change, but also part of, um, of, of the solution. And uh, here I want to recommend my colleague, Shamila, who will join us for this uh, uh, intervention, uh, initial webinar. And this is a very, and we are, we are proud to work together in this uh, topic. To conclude, I would like to underline that uh, while climate change is not a new phenomenon, its effects are happening now, impacting our present and future generations. We must resume our fight against climate change even as we combat COVID-19, and in this fight, false information is a key battle that we must win. We need to identify sustainable solutions that can comprehensively tackle both sides of false information. This requires a collaborative approach, bringing together scientists, journalists, and citizens to join forces against false information on climate change. In this endeavor, we can also count on the potential of innovation and new technologies, such as artificial intelligence, which have proven to be key in the response to the current pandemic. However, this is not an easy task. A more in-depth initiative gathering the efforts of all present is necessary. I hope that uh, this series of webinars will serve to shed some light on strategies that we may employ forge new alliances between inter interested stakeholders and uh, pave the way forward, a long-term initiative to address false information about climate change. I wish you fruitful discussions. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Banu. Thank, thank, thank you. Um, now I have the privilege to request Dr. Samila Naya Bedouel. Assistant Director General for Natural Sciences uh, of UNESCO. She is responsible for, uh, responsible for UNESCO's overall programmatic priorities of strengthening science, technology, and innovation systems and policies nationally, regionally, and globally, and promoting international scientific cooperation on critical challenges to sustainable development. It is a science. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Banu. Good afternoon, good morning to all of you, and thank you for giving us the privilege to join you here today. I'd like to thank uh, Ricardo Grassi and all the eminent speakers of today. I salute you for raising uh, really the banner and the profile of misinformation with respect to climate change. I also want to sincerely thank my colleague, Moez uh, Shak, the Assistant Director General for Communication and Information in UNESCO, for raising um, the profile of such an important uh, um, perspective on climate change today. I think the, um, the reason uh, probably I was invited to, to, to speak with you today is really to showcase to you how scientific information is so important. Scientific information, peer reviewed scientific information is crucial and is at the heart of climate change policies, climate change decision making, but also providing the citizens across the world the, the science behind climate change and avoiding the misinformation we see across the world today. Clearly combating this false information, such as in the context of the climate crisis today, is really of utmost concern. We hear today about declining biodiversity, how it's related to climate change, and how this decline in biodiversity has brought people closer to wild animals, and hence probably the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. We hear about the different scientific scenarios of how the virus has moved among animals, from wild animals to domesticated animals and to human beings. And yet we are still in an uncertainty of all of the signs behind how the virus has moved between the different reservoirs to reach man today. And this science at the heart of the COVID pandemic also makes us realize how important it is to reach out to people and populations across the world to correct science. 
But at the same time, dear colleagues, this negative impact of false information today is being multiplied through the information technologies which fly more than the speed of light today and was not available a few years ago. So I'd like to raise a couple of points with you for consideration in your distinct panels this afternoon, this morning. First of all, how can we um, support member states so that they develop, these are the 193 member states of UNESCO, how can we support them to develop and implement what I would call the climate change literacy, climate change knowledge and public awareness programs across each and every community. Second, how can we promote the interdisciplinary climate knowledge and scientific knowledge that is needed today to understand climate change impacts and mitigation? Who are these different knowledge systems that actually contribute to understanding climate change today? And how then do we tease out the different knowledge streams? What will be the role of the different knowledge streams? We talk about science, science which comes out of a laboratory, which has stood the test of time, but we also talk about the indig indigenous theological knowledge systems. These are based on empirical indigenous knowledge, which is not superstition, but really this empirical findings, which has progressed over millennia and based on locally developed knowledge systems. How can we bring all of these together in an interdisciplinary climate knowledge climate change platform. Thirdly, what is the role of the culture of science and promoting a culture of science? How to ensure that our cultural heritage of planet Earth is also taken into account in this dialogue um, across the world of safeguarding climate change, uh, safeguarding our planet against the, the climate change impacts. And fourth, a point I'd like to raise with you is how to support then this inclusive stakeholder dialogue so that messages are transmitted and received with the intent uh, behind those messages. How to ensure that these ethical and gender equality principles also taken into account in the climate change mitigation and adaptation uh, uh, messages that are being uh, presented across the world today. So first of all, it has to be recognized that the science of climate is not static. Science is changing continuously. This has been quite obvious with the pandemic, um, starting with the lockdown across the world and then the deep lockdown. Science is at the forefront of informing member states and governments on the new containment facilities that need to be taken. This understanding of science and this particular situation with the COVID has made us realize that science is continuously changing by days uh, as, as the science is coming out of laboratories. So how then can we ensure that can produce this new data, utilize it at the speed of social media? This is the biggest challenge today. So it's a role of the science and research to inform societies and communities to make informed decision making. But how then do we ensure that that information is relayed in a timely fashion. I would also like to share with you then the role of UNESCO. UNESCO has put together these enormous sites, UNESCO designated sites, which showcase how we can live in harmony with nature and how local populations are adapting to global threats. These sites are the UNESCO designated sites, the World Heritage Sites, the World Cultural Heritage Sites, the natural heritage sites, the biosphere reserves, where we are promoting man and the biosphere or man and the planet. These sites, which are also called the geoparks, where we are promoting our geological heritage. This is also the science of the environment. How then we can reach out to all of these different populations across the world in a very timely fashion uh, in order to, to build these resilient communities communities which are resilient to climate change, resilient misinformation, but also communities that have the information to make choices in the future. How then can we contribute to the production 
and sharing of this knowledge across the world. And finally, I would like to stress the important, importance of young people. Young people are really the guardians against false information. How can the social media ensure that the young and the youth across the world have relevant information that they, as the sternest advocates for sound science, are fully equipped to take over this knowledge and to transmit them in a way that will be appreciated by society, understood, and transformed into evidence-based policies. UNESCO hosted last year the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change here in UNESCO in Paris. The scientific reports which are produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on climate change are crucial decision making across the world. How can we ensure that the young people in different communities have access to this information, timely information, but also enabling them to access the information in different languages? If we want to prevent the false information and to prevent spread of false information, how can we empower our youth through different networks? UNESCO launched a network, a network which is called the Youth UNESCO Climate Action Network. This UCAN network is also very important to advocate against the misinformation and false information concerning climate change. However, the youth can only be empowered as far as the information they receive. So how can we ensure that we produce perhaps climate change platforms or climate change dashboards with the latest data and information so that people can access this information across the world in the language they understand, whether it's stakeholders, governments, NGOs, policymakers, and also our parents and future generations. So what kind of platform would we need? How can we ensure that this inclusive stakeholder platform also includes what we would call today the popularization of science and citizen science. We have a number of different initiatives across the world, but perhaps the most important um, initiative that we would like to consider right now is the tools for climate change information. What kind of tools would we need and how can we reinforce and denounce false information? How can we unite behind the science? So long-term success, of combating misinformation needs elaboration amongst all of us and we look forward to working with you so that quality information can shape the future and shape the future policies to combat misinformation. I thank you very much and thank you Mois, for inviting us to this. We look forward to working with you. I have many other ideas and thoughts I'd like to share with you but I'm sure I'm going to hear them from you from our distinguished panelists. So thank you Banu, and thank you to Moes for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you so much, ADZ. In fact, you know, your statement has indeed given us enough uh, uh, things to reflect upon, and we will definitely you know, do so. Um, right now, you know, I have the pleasure uh, to invite uh, my good friend, uh, Mr. Ricardo Grassi, who's the president of IPS Academy and director general of Citizen Platform. Um, he is uh, an Argentinian Italian journalist and former editor in, in chief of Interpress Service. Um, he founded SIC in, um, in 1985, focusing the impact of dominant development model on local cultural identities and building communication networks. He worked with UNESCO's Planet Society program. For the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, he organized a repartee environment uh, through the eyes of uh, 18 of world's major artists. Since 2004, he has been the founding executive director of Ind independent uh, Pazwok, uh, Afghan News, that is PAN. He's the co-founder of uh, Independent IPS Academy, which owns Citizens Platform on Climate Change uh, and a Sustainable World. Um, Mr. Grassi, the floor is yours. Your microphone is muted. Thank you. I thought that uh, someone else was clicking. Okay, here I am. Now you should, uh, do you hear me? Thank you, Banu, for this uh, generous presentation. At least it's long, yes. And, uh, and thank you very much to the speakers before because 
I mean, it's been very interesting, uh, uh, Moez and Shamila's uh, speech, um, the precise things that you have shared with us. And, and in a way, it uh, makes more and more clear why in this endeavor of building the citizens platform on climate change and a sustainable world, we are working together and co-organizing these webinars. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt about that and probably we are moving to a deeper and deeper alliance. So let me brief because there will be a specific detailed presentation on the last webinar next Monday of the platform in itself and the application. Mm -hmm. This was born some time back, uh, the idea of creating a digital uh, platform uh, and an application and the use of uh, social media to tackle what is the motto of these webinars, beyond confusion and inspiring actions. Mm? This resumes what the citizens pla platform wants to be, that also is addressed mainly to citizens, not what well, we are all citizens, uh, including those in the private sector and institutions, etc., etc. But uh, this idea coming from the strictly information and communication uh, area, we're all professionals on that, and this is not collateral to any other initiative. It's in itself an independent information and communication initiative on climate change and sustainability. Now, why? Because it was evident that through this information and fake news, we citizens were getting very, very much confused. Hmm? They've been, we started discussing about this back to 2017, then major things happens, happened and climate change is a successful communication uh, uh, endeavor in terms of creating more and more awareness. Another question started coming up then, but what can I do? This is the other question. I, I go to, to, for a coffee to the bar and I try to talk, no? And what do you think about this? Yes, of course, I have no doubt, but what can I do? So we structure this digital platform in two main sectors, let's say. The one that has to do with beyond confusion, and trying to build a sort of one-stop shop where through proper positioning and, and communication, uh, anyone can go knowing that you will get what you need to get and that this is going to be accurate and that will be no doubt. And accuracy goes to the point that if something seems probable but is doubtful, we have to say it. Now, the only way to be extremely accurate is, has to do with the sources of information. The sources of information in our case are scientists, experts, building an active interaction with them as sources of information and also suggesting timely issues to be raised, for instance. No? We already have a, the initial and, and very active partnership with the Tyndall Center for climate research in the UK that exists from the, since the last 20 years. And we are building more with other scientific uh, 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 centers. Um, and building a network, because today we have a lot of organizations delivering information. So we are not, we don't compete. We don't need to compete. I mean, as Communication and information, this initiative is unique. So we want to be absolutely inclusive. If there's something called nature, I mean, very well known, prestigious, I mean, as a, as a media, as a medium, well, we build a relation with nature and we will simply include a link that leads to nature on things that we don't need to do. That's and that's the same, that's an example, no? sort of 
clearing house when we all come together and we empower each other, but we build a place where a regular citizen can go and knowing that we found there what he's looking for without going into what's become an endless universe, which is the internet. I mean, the point of departure for all this was that, well, you, you cannot pretend that a normal, regular citizen, uh, even myself, would start navigating, exploring the, the internet to see who says the truth, who's not saying the truth, where should I go, whatever. Well, it's not possible. So that's one main part, beyond confusion, which includes contributing to a debate. Because we have to acknowledge that changing paradigm is not uh, particularly simple, no? And it's not going to be resolved, and it's not our role to start pointing, no? Uh, um, naming who's guilty, who's not guilty, because that's already being done in a good way. We don't need to go on that. We need and we want to show a way forward. Another paradigms which require debate, going in depth. Hmm? Okay, we say we have to finish with fossil, fossil energy, let's say. But how do you do it? And we explore. The other big branch is answering to what can I do? Hmm? which is the inspiring actions component. Hmm? Well, that's about telling stories, which is what the journalistic soul of this can make. There are thousands and thousands of people in the world testing new ways of producing, new ways of consuming, new ways of living together. And we have different cultural backgrounds, no? which is a major thing. I mean, the situation today is that one part of the world is mainly responsible for the emissions and for destroying the entire world, and another part of the world suffer the consequences and try to accommodate or is seeing how to accommodate. Within this, there's a lot of very creative people or people that don't give up. And this becomes our heroes. So we have to tell about our heroes. We have to tell stories, not only the result of their personal story. We do care about the personal story. Why did you decide to produce in a different way and that way shows to be successful? Why did you go into the circular economy together with others what difficulties you had to face and why is it working? Hmm? Well, this on daily basis, because nobody today is telling us about this for several reasons. I mean, a regular, <coughs> the regular media enterprises could not dedicate to this. I mean, they face uh, endless financial problems. They have a market uh, to, to satisfy, etc., etc. So, uh, but we can do it, and we will do it on a daily basis. This will be processed in different ways, the story in itself, but then also a kind of technical file that explains in detail each initiative. This, in a way, is what we started doing. And I say we, because I was honored to work on that as an, as, as an outsider with the UNESCO's Planet Society program, you see. It was not, climate change or sustainability on the top, as, as the wording, let's say. But the principle was that, uh, uh, looking for new ways of living, new ways of doing things. Mm? And we did a heavy, heavy work, really, collecting information on initiatives worldwide. Mm? Once I asked to the one who was this was framed within the International Decade for the Culture of uh, Peace and Nonviolence, no? And I asked, how do, how do you do with this? I mean, there are wars everywhere. Well, but we are identifying worldwide people working in the sense of life. 
and putting them together. Okay, I don't want to be too much long because probably I'll get longer and Banu and also Moes know that I could speak and speak and speak. So I close here. <laughs> I thank you and I go to my role of moderator. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricardo. And, and thank you so much uh, to both ADGs for highlighting the importance of the topic. Uh, with uh, these three um, um, like opening remarks, so to say, uh, we shall now move uh, forward to our uh, panel discussion. Today we have gathered some of the most notable people in this field uh, from different stakeholder groups, from scientists, uh, scientific, uh, scientific uh, field to a documentarian and uh, civil society and you name it. They will discuss the phenomena of false information about climate change as observed from their vantage point, negative impacts they have already observed, and some possible ways to combat the phenomena. Before we begin the discussion, I would like to invite our audience members to post any questions that you may have in the Q&A channel uh, as the uh, discussion goes on. Our team will be monitoring this, and at the end of the panel discussion, uh, we will take up these questions and ask the panel, pa panelists to respond. Now to start uh, us up, uh, we invite our panelists to share their observation on perspective from their respective fields and, uh, from, and the proliferation of false information surrounding climate change. Each panelist uh, will have about eight minutes to make their initial pitch. Uh, without further ado, allow me to ask uh, Ricardo to introduce the first panel panelist. You have to uh, please uh, unmute yourself. Here's our you, first uh, speaker. Bon dia, Astrid Caldas. <laughs> we were neighbors once, huh? Oh, really? Bon dia. Yeah, I, was, I, I, I was born in Argentina and you were near me and then you moved to the United States. I'm in Europe, you see. Okay, so Astrid Caldas, which is, she's a doctor, mm -hmm, is a senior climate scientist uh, with the Climate and Energy Program of the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is one of the very important associations of scientists. Um, her research focuses particularly on climate change adaptation with uh, practical policy implications no, for ecosystems, the economy and society. She has also journalistic skills. <laughs> she blogs for the Huffington Post uh, and has been Boris, regularly quoted by various newspapers and websites. So, and I was told that as a, as a spokesperson for the Union of Concerned Scientists, you are particularly efficient and uh, attractive in the way of sharing things. So, we look forward to your comments, please. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. I'm uh, sorry we are not in Paris, but uh, you know, you can't have everything. We'll always have Paris, right? Um, so I work with climate science and climate change impacts. And my organization, the Union of Concerned Scientists, is really dedicated to the maintenance of a healthy and safe environment. So we protect all forms of life. We put rigorous independent science to work to solve our planet's most pressing problems. And science helps keep us safe and healthy as we all know. We all rely on scientific information to make informed choices about the things we do, what we eat, what products we buy. Science is everywhere around us. So it stands to reason that when we see misinformation, disinformation, or misleading data and commentary, we address it. Our values guide our work, and when it comes to science, we believe that it is essential for protecting our lives, health, and safety, and for protecting our life uh, and for developing solutions for the many challenges we face. Scientific research must be conducted ethically and transparently and never be suppressed or sidelined. Furthermore, government decisions should always be informed by the best available data. However, as we know, we are seeing more and more instances of not only disinformation, 
but also plain dismissal of science in decision making in the United States and other countries. I'll mention my own country uh, of birth, Brazil. Um, the extreme partisanship we currently witness in many countries has led to almost criminal misuse of science to appease special interests. Foremost among those is the discovery a few years back of oil companies' disinformation campaigns, which lasted for the past few decades. However, instead of uh, acting to improve the situation, when they found out that the burning of their products was becoming a problem, fossil fuel companies started a series of campaigns to deliberately deceive the public about the reality of climate change and block any actions that might curb carbon emissions. So I'm gonna give you a few pointers about the disinformation campaigns, which are, are, they are nothing new. And they are not done only by big oil. Uh, they follow a well-known pattern that has been used before, most glaringly by tobacco back, back then. And it follows a playbook. And it's basically um, um, it based on a few practices that are very deceiving. I'm gonna list them quickly for you. The first practice is the fake, where they conduct counterfeit science and try to pass it off as legitimate science. Some companies choose to manufacture science selectively publishing positive results while underreporting negative results. And they even commission studies, scientific studies with flawed methodologies um, that uh, are biased towards predetermined predeter results. These methods undermine the scientific process. And as our case studies show, they can have serious public health and safety consequences. The second practice is the blitz, and it consists of harassing scientists who um, speak out with results or views that are inconvenient to the industry. Companies and industry trade associations sometimes try to bury scientific information by harassing or intimidating scientists uh, that threaten their bottom line. They threaten to defund scientists, transfer their, tarnish their reputations, and each of these tactics has the same goal, which is to silence scientists and discourage independent science. Third practice is the diversion. They manufacture uncertainty about science that where little or none exists, they just create this doubt. They falsely spread doubt and deceive the public, undermining the efforts of regulatory bodies to protect the public. And our case studies show that um, corporations have deployed trade associations with honest sounding names that look real and look like very reliable. Uh, but uh, with that, they influence public opinion, gain access to policymakers, and maintain the illusion of independence while the while undermining science. The fourth practice is the screen where corporations buy credibility through alliances with academia and professional societies. They sometimes exploit these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, alliances to influence research and spread misinformation, also undermining science. This is very common. You say, oh, such and such companies, oh, they work with the university such, but it's not a real thing. And finally, the fix. The fix is where corporations manipulate government officials or processes to inappropriately influence policies. Um, those, some companies even undermine the way federal agencies use science to develop uh, policy, making it harder for agencies to fulfill their science-based missions. Uh, such actions compromise the government's ability to act independently and protect the public as they should. So to finalize, these are just a few examples of how climate science disinformation spreads, but it's very obvious when you see it. There are many actors in display, but there are also many fighting it, and the public is listening. And polls have showed recently that uh, the views on global warming have been steadily changing, and we must continue to fight. The more we bring out the truth and expose misleading tactics, we hold more hope that there will be action to reduce emissions and that the worst of climate change will be avoided. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kaldas. Uh, those are some very deep observations, uh, and I think you know all of us in definitely have to ponder them. Allow me now to invite uh, Professor Dave Niyogi um, uh, from uh, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, uh, Professor Niyogi holds the Dave P. Carlton Centennial Professorship in the Department of Geological Sciences at Jackson School of Geosciences and the Department of Civil Architectural and environmental engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. 
He's also a professor and former state climatologist uh, uh, for Indiana at uh, Purdue University, U.S. Uh, professor Nyogi is an Indian, but he has the he was the immediate past chair of the American Meteorological Society's Board on uh, Urban Environment. is now member of its uh, Applied Cl Climate uh, Committee. He's also an uh, elected board member of the uh, International Association for Urban Climatologists, uh, Climatology. He is particularly known for his pioneering work um, on, on urban climate and extreme weather events, as well as uh, for, uh, for, for data-driven approaches to make climate uh, information useful to usable. So, uh, Professor Nyogi, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Banu. Uh, what a remarkable way to start your week, getting such brilliant ideas on such an important topic. Uh, it certainly energizes what we ought to be doing. And I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this happening over the next several weeks and see what actually emerges out of this. Uh, I, I, I had made some comments, I, I had been starting to write them up, but I was so impressed uh, by the preciseness, as Ricardo also mentioned, by the comments that came from the, uh, the two ADGs uh, regarding the kind of things that uh, they would like to see and they could actually envision. Uh, I just wanted to bring a couple of those up, which uh, I thought were extremely incisive in terms of where this whole context of disinformation, the climate, the climate change, and essentially what we can do going ahead can all be tied up. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I, I appreciated uh, ADG Moise's comments about uh, the linkages between climate and COVID. Uh, if you really look at it, COVID is a global phenomena. You're seeing it most in cities. The same way, climate is a global phenomena and we are experiencing what the future world would be in the context of what is happening in cities, in terms of the warming we are seeing, in terms of the exposure we are creating for people, in terms of the emissions that are coming from the city. And at the same time, it provides us with a beautiful collaboratory to test the solutions now to get ready for a future world. So cities become critical. And uh, we are learning a lot in terms of how we can start looking at those things. The second thing that I really appreciated was the call to inspire solutions and, and how we can create solutions. Uh, we have been doing, and, I, and this sort of reflects on the NG uh, uh, Shamila's comments about climate literacy, and we had been doing projects across in Asia in Africa and United States, Midwest and so forth, where we have been looking at this whole context of how do you improve climate literacy going right from middle school to high school to university, citizens and beyond. And one of the enduring conclusions that emerges is that climate like politics is very local. We need to have a local context we need to have a local solution and we need to have actions which we think we can initiate and create rather than being at the receiving end of something that has happened globally. So while this is a global phenomena, and I, I really appreciate what is being discussed in terms of how do we create this whole framework of tools which sort of democratizes this process of creating knowledge information out of data and tools. So if we take a step back, I look at it from the context of a scientist. Uh, many a times uh, we are of course quoted as being the source of what might be the source of misinformation or disinformation. But at the same time, the scientific community, you must be made aware, is also at the receiving end of the problems that occur because of the misinformation and how it takes our resources away. Uh, and let me, let me couple, say first of all, that why is this so easy in the world of climate change to have disinformation? First and foremost, climate is very difficult. We don't experience climate, we experience weather. 
very few of us over a period of our lifetime, we are going to be experiencing climate change when we look at things. Even when you start looking at the context of how climate and weather is being reported, we have seen so many times reports about persons talking about an intense snowstorm and equating that where is global warming. So we see this dichotomy of understanding about weather versus climate. Even within that, you can start seeing climate is classified between climate change versus climate variability. We have this aspect coming in. Within that, we have players which are at a natural scale, like emissions coming from volcanoes and natural forest fires and clouds and so forth, and the El Nino, which can cause natural changes in the climate. And then we have the human induced changes, which can cause long term specific changes going into the future, which could be, say, from urbanization, land use change, our own uh, pollution, as well as our emissions that we all know are critically shown without any doubt to be causing these climatic changes. Now, the problem is when you're presenting a scenario about a climate, it is very easy to see that all of these factors are acting in tandem. It is not like it is only a natural effect or only an artificial feature that is acting together. All of these features are acting together. And so it is very easy for anyone to slice a part of an event and present it in the manner that makes most convenient sense to their perspective. Secondly, it may not be that there is a wild intent in presenting such information. The person who is presenting it might genuinely believe that this is the scientific way that they should be presenting this. And this is the really important hypothesis that ought to be conveyed to the community, which is at the backbone of science. So we have two people or two groups, what one would say, who genuinely believe that they are doing good science, who genuinely believe that they are advancing something which is for the good of the society many a times. And within that, we create a potential for an outsider to look at possibilities which could create a potential for confusion and disinformation. What is also, of course, relevant here is that there are several entities which would have an agenda driven uh, framework here that they are trying to perpetuate embedded within the wilds of presenting new knowledge. And that is where we have our biggest challenge going ahead. That yes, at one level, we want to support this novel ideas of hypothesis driven science. We want to respect and support freedom of speech. And at the same time, we need to find a way that this embedded disinformation that starts getting perpetuated either intently or without knowledge, how do we separate that out? So there are several things that start emerging that this is a, as we call it, a wicked problem. We have it going everywhere. We can't rely only on the source. And hence, as I mentioned, we need to democratize this whole process of how can people create institutions and countries create their own mechanisms by which this can be filtered out. So there are a few things that need to be done and I'll quickly summarize that I've been thinking and going on. So first and foremost, data as we all know is a new currency. Uh, as we are getting into a data driven world, data is going to be creating lots of commercial values. In a climate and weather scenario, data has always been regarded as an open entity which ought to be freely shared. You might be war at a country, but you'll be sharing weather information because that's how the weather and climate community has worked. We need to find a way to ensure climatic information and data is freely and openly available. That, even though it looks like an obvious, has to be one of the critical mandate of this. Keep it accessible, keep it open. Second, we need to have tools. These tools can be at one end, highly technology driven based on artificial intelligence, which is looking at patterns and so forth. But it also needs to have portals. These portals that we discussed would have framework of where we are looking at examples, where you're looking for access to data. 
but more importantly, resources, that you cannot control the source of information, but you can control the manner in which you can analyze and create your own information. So you need to have this knowledge base. So that brings a very important concept of capacity building. And the capacity building is where I think we have the most enduring and sustained information that can be created for the community that goes across the generations. So we talked about climate change education. We have done these projects across uh, working with UNESCO. There has been a very, very successful uh, example I have seen, particularly in the Southeast Asia region of a monsoon school that they had been doing and conducting and supporting for uh, uh, urban flooding, uh, which you know really took information from highly heterogeneous sources, brought out the experiential aspect, made people start thinking like policymakers, like engineers, young PhDs, fresh PhDs, young researchers, and really starting to see the complexity and the non-linearity of these decisions outside the classroom teaching. This exposure is very important that you have a highly complex and non-linear world. Third is we have been doing things for peer review exercise. We heard this, peer review is a backbone of our climate change research. But how often do we actually teach peer review? So we had been actually developing modules and courses to teach peer review, and we need to take this into a common language across the communities to really understand the value and the principles behind it. Embedded somewhere, we need to be recognizing the freedom of speech aspect and making sure that when we are filtering this thing out, we do not impede on that basic human right of freedom of speech. Just because we may not like something, we cannot not listen to it. We need to ensure that. Uh, at the UN level, I think projects are really required that hold countries uh, accountable to some extent not to be creating this kind of disinformation or supporting projects which could be creating this information. But at the same time, creating pilots that can be scaled, reproduced, and used by member nations as seeing as examples in a manner in which this whole premise that we take information, data, and knowledge from a useful to usable framework that can be taken to communities is really possible. And that goes to on the context, as I mentioned, like doing uh, uh, communication skills. It could be in the context of you know, the storytelling aspect I heard from Ricardo. It could be in the climate literacy aspect. It could be data-driven tools for specific projects. I think bottom line, going back to COVID, we have all seen that we are living in goodness. There are people around us who are really trying to do good things. If you really generally look around. If you go with this context that communities and people are trying to do good, to present them with more options of how to do good, else they are going to be doing their old fashioned ways that they always thought this is the only way of doing it and not be able to come up with novel ideas for this novel problem. I think creating this multifaceted do good options creating these tools that we can start utilizing in terms of uh, the knowledge sharing and integration of ideas, we can really come up with the ways that, uh, that creates disinformation as a way that can be filtered out. We cannot ever take away disinformation from the society. But what we can do is create tools that we can at least find ways to filter some of it out. And I firmly believe even a small change into this dialogue can cascade in creating more and more such powerful techniques that can happen going ahead into the future. So I really appreciate the opportunities that are being considered here. I'm, I'm excited about what would be emerging from here a few years from now, a few months from now, and, and we can see it all started here. I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Niyogi. Extremely useful going into nuances of any complex situation because you need, we need to understand that, to acknowledge the complexity of everything and at the same time, as we observe so much, people convinced of what they are saying. Hmm? Not, not with 
bad mood. I mean, they, apart from those evidently linked to specific interests, but then it's a matter as in this area as in others, no? And, uh, and this combination of moving from concepts to actions through tools and including generating the opportunity of doing good, which is very important. With this, I would like now to, with pleasure, to introduce Miss Leila Connors, which uh, takes us to another, for me, very important area of activity. She is a filmmaker, a documentary maker. She's also a writer. She has created a group, I mean, the Tree Media Group, to carry on her interests, her concerns. Uh, out of that uh, came a first important uh, documentary called The Eleventh Hour, mm, where she interviewed 54 leading thinkers, mm, uh, and so including scientists, on the state of the world and the human condition. Later on, together with uh, 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 Leonardo DiCaprio as a producer, she directed a very important documentary called Ice on Fire, where focusing the climate change goes into showing us specific existing solutions and specific practices that are being moved forward. And now she's working in a new project, uh, with the difficulties of the COVID to move around and to be shooting. Uh, the, the title of the project is Into Eden, and it's about how we can change our society and ourselves on the face of the forces that threaten everything from the biosphere to our economic system. So while we were working to invite uh, Leila to participate uh, with an accent on the inspiring actions component of our endeavor. <laughs> well, thank you, Ricardo, and thank you, UNESCO. Actually, I w went to school in Paris. And I lived across the street from UNESCO, so I remember it well. Um, I founded Tree Media. Actually, I have a background in international politics and economics and was in think tanks for a while. Uh, when I realized that the story is the most important thing to move society in the direction that we need. And this is why I like this, this panel very much. So thank you for having the vision to discuss this in depth and come up with solutions. Um, I'll just, as you know, I'm speaking from my experience. Um, I feel like I've been in the trenches of something I call the story machine. The story machine is created by entrenched interests that Astrid discussed. Um, basically, it comes down to a barrage of information, false information and money that is supported by the story machine. It's an ecosystem of interests that control access to information in the world. So the good work of scientists, which I, you know, I work with them to tell these stories, you know, um, we're up against this, like what I call the Death Star, and we're like the Rebel Alliance that are little ships that are trying to get into this giant edifice of, of information. Now, one would think, and I was very naive when I first did the 11th Hour with Leo the first time around, we thought, wow, you know, when we tell everybody what's going on, then everything's going to change and everyone's going to go, oh, okay, this is what's happening and we're all going to change. Well, we found out that that's not what happens. What happens is it gets suppressed and sequestered. One of my um, anecdotes is that in Cannes, we went the first time around, you know, the, you know, interestingly, the French um, and the Europeans are very supportive of our work. And they gave us a big platform in Khan to bring out our, both our movies. The first time they thought that, you know, just because it's a science doc, maybe no one would show up in the press. Uh, so they gave us a small room, not because they were mean, it's just because they thought maybe no one would show up. Well, we ended up getting 300 international journalists and they had to book a giant theater to do our press conference. So we thought, wow, we're, we're doing this. It's great. It's amazing. And then one of these guys who's paid by the Coke network or whoever they're paid by, 
from Fox News, uh, Sky was in the front row and he asked about how Leo gets around. And Leo doesn't, you know, he, he's very modest actually, given what his options are. And anyway, long story short, the only thing that left the room was all about Leo and nothing about climate change. So basically, um, that's what happens. That was the, probably the, you know, the diversion meeting the, the fix or whatever. No, not the fix, meeting the screen or whatever. <laughs> so anyway, um, I loved Astro what you were saying. I've encountered almost every element of those five different things. And so, so not, needless to say, not to be deterred, I tried to figure out how to get around the story machine and how to how to do this. And this is what you're what you're talking about. I, I don't really tend to call it fake information because of course that exists. What you're dealing with is a much larger edifice underneath the fake information. This is entrenched interests that have no interest in changing. It's how they make their money. Uh, and they feed each other. So, you know, the major networks, for example, have you ever wondered why when they talk about the weather, they never talk about climate? I mean, that's a very you know, the Weather Channel started to do it. There have been a few, you know, uh, weather people that, you know, talk about climate, but they don't because they're not allowed to. So that's, that's, that's what we're dealing with. I think you guys all know that. Um, but, you know, again, what I would I'd like to say also is I think things are starting to work. Sadly, they're working a little bit too late. Uh, we have the tools and the knowledge. You know, we know what to do. It's really about getting around the algorithms on social media. Now, for example, I tried to post stuff on climate very recently on Facebook, and they wouldn't let me boost a post about planting trees because they said it was political. Okay, so we're getting a, uh, a suppression of the information because these interests, I think, are seeing that change is coming and they're becoming more blatant in the suppression of the information. They've actually been very sneaky. You know, not a lot of us knew that they were actively suppressing until the Exxon papers came out. Maybe scientists knew. I mean, I've talked to a lot of scientists like Michael Mann, for example, who has been excoriated by, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the Blitz. The Blitz has really taken out a lot of scientists. And so, and even me. So when we, when I wanted to talk, so Leonardo and I, Leonardo came to me to talk about methane um, eight years ago. And we were suppressed by not just, um, well, self-edited, let's say, in the sense, because all of the scientists were worried that if we talked about methane, we would frighten people. And they were already having a hard enough time convincing people of basic carbon information. They said, oh my God, if you start talking about methane, everyone's just gonna you know, not engage in the, in the topic. So, What's what it to add to not to go through what because I was going to talk a bit about what Ashton was talking about, but since she covered that, I would just say to add on it's be, because there's so much pressure to deny climate that, even, especially here in the states, it's incredibly hard to even go beyond just the basic concepts. So that's slowing us down. All right, so it's not all bad news. So here's where I've landed um, in this. Uh, is that we have to be fiercely independent and that's what we are here at True Media and, and we are working now with international groups of small groups of people to create a new platform. I hear you guys are doing it too, but we're actually going to launch a platform that's completely independent and um, and interestingly, it's, inc you know, funding is, you know, like for everything like this, funding is strangely hard to get. You know, even, you know, all the scientists, you know, you, you trying to save the world and trying to change the story is one of the hardest things to get funded because everyone who are in the philanthropy world really understands change on the ground, which I fully appreciate. So, you know, is how do you get, you know, millions of dollars to change the story machine when actually you could be putting in windmills or solar or, you know, wells or all these other things that the world needs. But, you know, and, and I, and give, coming from Hollywood, everyone always thinks we're really well funded, which is, you know, not the case. It, Hollywood has no, in, Hollywood meaning the studios and the streamers and all that, you know, do, do something like the screen, which is they do a few 
stories here and there, but they're absolutely not interested in this, right? They have no interest. Uh, it doesn't make them the money. My argument is if they actually advertised as much for our films as their other blockbusters, we'd get as much audience. One of the metrics for some of my movies, we had some of the biggest attendance ever in a weekend on our first weekend ever. And I got a call from Warner Brothers head saying, wow, that was amazing. But, but after that weekend, they didn't advertise anymore. They didn't even list us in the paper. So people didn't even know we were playing. So it's, it's, it, that really blew my mind. I didn't understand why that happened. So here's what you need to do. Independent platforms has to be well-funded because you have to get around the algorithm. The algorithms are suppressing this information. You need hackers, like not hackers to do bad things, but hackers to do good things. They need to find out where and how it's being suppressed. For example, we had Green World Rising, which has the pathway forward. We put it out six years ago, and some people in the middle of the country can't even see our website. I've had phone calls that said, hey, you know, I've heard of this website, it's not coming up. So there's that happening. The other thing um, one should do is explain it differently. And I found with Ice on Fire, we got a lot of traction. And what, what's working in terms of messaging is the drawdown message, is the carbon up, carbon down. So why is that interesting? I mean, yes, climate is complex. It's changing all the time. We know that. However, overall, in all the nuances of climate, it's carbon up, carbon down. We live within a band of carbon in the, in, the, in the atmosphere that wavers, but obviously it's shooting way beyond its frame. So people don't quite get that. We've been talking about greenhouse gas emissions. We've been talking a lot about emissions, but we don't really talk about how it comes down again. We've only been talking about how it goes up. And so this idea that it's a cycle, which of course we're taught in school, but that hasn't been this at the head of the spear of the climate messaging. What I'm finding with Ice on Fire is that it's gotten a lot of traction because we've explained the cycle a little better. I mean, more, not better. Let's not say better. Let's just say that was our focus. So for example, why is that important? Because that gives people something to do. Because when you're just talking about emissions, you're talking about, you know, governmental level, you know, electricity grids, they're dealing with coal or, you know, nukes or whatever it is, you know, hopefully renewables. Uh, but when you're talking about carbon sequestration and pulling it out of the sky, you're talking about tree planting, which a lot of people can get. You're talking about changing the way we grow food, organic farming, soil, biochar, kelp planting. I mean, you're talking now about, you're gauging a lot more people. And so that's I think where we need to head in terms of the messaging, because you really engage a lot of people with the drawdown message. Now, whether you wanna call it drawdown or whatever else, it doesn't matter, but it's the idea that yes, we can actually pull it out of the sky and put it back in the ground. Nature does it, and we really need to focus on that. Of course, now we focus the nice on fire on the director capture machines made out of existing parts. Yes, tech has a role to play. There's also, I know a lot of biomimetic, new visionary information, uh, innovations where you're passively um, pulling carbon out of the sky. So that's kind of like, I explain it to Pete, not you don't need to explain it, but other people, that it's like bailing out a, you know, bailing out a sinking ship with buckets. You gotta just get it out of the sky. You've got legacy carbon and current carbon all right, so, uh, so platforms. So we've actually also built something called Catching Carbon to disrupt also the flow of money. So a lot of people are like, well, we have to wait to change policy, which absolutely we have to change policy. We have to work on that every day. But what happens if the world decided to circumvent policy and just pay for it in microtransactions? So for example, catchingcarbon.org is an experiment. We launched it. Uh, just before COVID, and so I haven't been advertising that, but it's a, it's a question. You know, what happens if the world put in 100 DAC machines, you know, acres and acres of kelp and all these trees, just as a symbolic gesture to say, hey, you know, we want to pay, we can save ourselves. We don't actually need to try and get around all of the policy people that are bought out by the fix. 
which they are. I mean, here we've done tons of other movies called We the People 2.0, where we've been on the ground in Ohio and Pennsylvania. They are ravaged by horror. I mean, not just bad information, but their entire legislative bodies are bought by the oil industry. There are laws in America where you can't even sue the oil industry for anything. Even if they killed you by accident with one of their wells, you cannot sue them. So it's bad. So <laughs> you have to work around these people. They have no interest in helping. And um, so I would only say that given what we see with people like Greta, who emerged and the climate strikes and the in California we're getting more and more towards solar I mean we are I think now 30% renewable in the state of California and it's getting better every day I would say given the amount of disinformation and money and entrenched politicians that we're dealing with in the story machine that has no interest in telling the story that we've done much better than I thought <laughs> so I would say persistence persistent platforms, funding uh, workarounds, the algorithms, getting smart people to, to make sure that when you put a message out, it goes out because again, no one sees it. Um, young people understand this. They absolutely do. They just don't know what to do. So the drawdown message I think is incredibly important. Um, and last but not least, we're working on something called regeneration. So we can fix everything that we've harmed. There are innovators and scientists that know what to do again. So we're working on, a, a within the platform, a giant push to talk about how to heal all things, land, ocean, air. And we'll be working on that in the next couple of years. So hopefully we can do it in collaboration with, with international networks and UNESCO and the UN and and usually whatever we do the UN and the EU and everyone picks it up and puts it around but now we as you say we all have to work together because there's not a lot of time and we this regeneration project actually came to me they said let's do a big Netflix series I said you know what let's not do that that's a we don't need that we need to just put it out on a platform for free on the internet just do this um, so now we're trying to find, although it's going to take quite a lot of, you know, in, you know, it's a large budget to do it, but you need it. <laughs> Again, I mean, I feel bad, but it's like, you know, do we want to change the story machine or not? So um, that's what I have to say from my corner of the world. Um, yes. <laughs> Good for all the things you said, really, really. So it's mobilizing no and then like in this meeting together like like reaching and touching how to try to coordinate and move forward doing things together no i mean which is so really gives me so much energy because then we collect we've all we're all active and concerned and and doing so that means collecting a lot of experience no as also on the science side, I mean, the collection of the experience of the things that you see, how they move, you know? and all the communication system and what you call the story machine. You know? This is, I love this synthesis, which is so, so, so American in a way. <laughs> Good, thanks. We may go back to you with some questions later, and also looking for questions from the, from the audience. And now, I would like to invite Catherine Rogers to, to talk. Uh, Kathleen is the president of Earth Day Network. You all know the Earth Day Network. It uh, celebrated its 50th anniversary um, last month, uh, which is enormous, no? I mean, something that started well, actually, it started in the United States in, in a small, humble way, but with all the communication energy that uh, we learn from such a place and became an extraordinary world network led by Kathleen. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathleen has uh, 20 years as an environmental attorney and uh, uh, an advocate. 
uh, and uh, under her leadership, the Earth Day Network has been growing and growing. So I look forward to what you can share with us, uh, Kathleen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for having me. So going towards the end of a program like this, um, not only am I mentally rearranging everything I was going to say, but I also want to echo everybody, Layla and Astrid and everybody. Um, you know, mm -hmm. my background was litigation and policy, so I've done that for years. But when I moved over to Earth Day Network, my, um, I agreed to move, um, and it was run by the environmental community at the time, but I only agreed to move if we could change the mission of the organization, which was to diversify the environmental movement because I'd been in the environmental movement globally for a long time and particularly in Western countries. Um, it was run by a handful of people. It certainly wasn't diverse. And so we changed our mission because as we know, tragically, we are mostly talking to ourselves. Um, and my organization is about what we call everyone else. And uh, we're global in 192 countries. We have about a billion people participating in Earth Day, but it's really tough to move them from a volunteer activity or even a big civic engagement event down that pathway to believe in climate change and take action. And after all, we're looking for not just activists, but consumers and voters and people that will actually take more than a single action of cleaning up their neighborhood or signing a petition. And with seven point whatever billion people in the world, it's a heavy lift. It's incredibly hard work. Uh, and the way we do this is not by putting environmental groups in front of people or movie stars or anything else, but the way we work anyway, is by finding trusting, trusted leaders of their community. So if I'm working with evangelicals or I'm working with uh, somebody in Zambia, I'm gonna find out who the trusted leaders are of a group that's not environmental, and then we go after them. And as a result, we have the most diverse group of environmental, non-environmental mayors, whatever, uh, hundreds of thousands of groups in our network that have nothing to do with the environment. They could be development groups or justice groups, but for a large, the large part of them have nothing to do with my movement at all. Uh, and again, that's a long, complicated, process. And I also agree with everybody who said that all politics is local. And so you really need to get local groups. Um, and I'd also like to say, and I think this is probably shared by most of the people in on this call, is that if you want to start in the middle, you don't, uh, if you want to end in the middle, you don't start there. And so a lot of our perspectives have to be stretching uh, the rubber band, so to speak, in the right direction, or we'll just never get where we want to go. And I'd like to start just with a few comments about science generally and what we're seeing globally. Uh, the backbone of Earth Day and the birth of the environmental movement, it wasn't actually a, a small thing. There were 20 million people out in the streets, more than 10 or 11% of the population back then. And it scared the heck out of everybody because there were so many people and they weren't environmentalists. Some anti-war activists, but for the most part, they were suits and moms and kids teachers, not your usual suspects. And that drove Congress and the president at the time, Nixon, believe it or not, uh, to do a lot of amazing things. Um, unfortunately, but it was science driven. And unfortunately, we had Rachel Carson at the time, we had the bald eagle, we had uh, 150 years of industrial development that had trashed the joint, so to speak. Uh, so unlike climate change, a lot of this was really obvious. You couldn't see across the street in LA. You had children with birth defects. You had all that stuff that was painfully, dramatically obvious, um, which again, is not always true for climate change. In fact, they interviewed people after Sandy, which was a huge hurricane that we had in Northern New Jersey and hit Staten Island really bad. And they interviewed, Staten Island's the only Republican, not to be partisan, but the only, one of the most Republican areas of New York City, maybe the only one, and they interviewed people there who had been completely destroyed by Sandy, and they all said emphatically over and over again in this um, documentary that it wasn't climate change, it was just a freak incident. They weren't willing to go beyond, because of their beliefs, um, to accept that maybe this was a hurricane of a lifetime, something they hadn't seen in 150 years or whatever. Um, and unfortunately, I think science is taking a hit in popular opinion generally, and of course, that's very apparent in the United States. And just in the last two years, 
uh, trust in science or distrust in science has really grown uh, and globally true. Uh, even in highly developed countries, a high level of trust in um, science, and this is Western Europe, the United States and other countries, is 18% of the world's population has a high trust in science. And the poorer you are, the less you believe in science. And as we all know, religious people choose science last, um, pick religious um, beliefs and tenets consistently. Uh, and how did this happen? Despite 97% of the world agreeing, uh, of scientists agreeing that climate change has been around for maybe up to 50 years, you know, where, where, what's the arc um, of the disinformation? And I think you have to look at history. Um, and a couple of people said this, and I'm not a big conspiracy person, but I live and work in Washington where my neighbors are lobbyists and they live all around me and it's a company town. And so, you know, everyone, you see them at the grocery store, you see them everywhere. And I'm sure this is true in other countries where you have a capital and politics all in one place. Um, and corporations say one thing um, to me and they pay their lobbyists to do something and say the opposite. So you could have really good companies out there or really good PR campaigns, um, but they're all funding the American Petroleum Institute to go do their dirty work behind our backs. And we know that and we still have them over for dinner. Um, climate denying politicians once they're in office can fuel the disinformation. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples and somebody mentioned this, but this is, history repeats itself. And in the United States and other countries, it happens. But I'll give you two, one super obvious, and the other one not so obvious, about what big business does to convince people, politicians and people, um, that things aren't just, aren't that bad. Um, and tobacco's a great one. In fact, the guy who runs Climate Nexus, a big important journal, Jeff Nesbitt, who worked briefly for Earth Day Network, uh, ran the anti-tobacco campaign for um, the Senate, an awesome guy. Um, but they spent 30 years paying people off and giving cigarettes away and doing the same thing ExxonMobil and everybody else does, big oil, big gas, big coal, um, and hiding the information from the public. And of course they paid. Uh, but the beauty of this for them was that the campaign of misinformation and the lack of, uh, or the inability of the anti-tobacco community, which are moms and dads and some um, companies, but for the most part, just people, it took them 30 years to defeat, uh, if you will, temporarily, the tobacco companies, but they'd planned for this. The tobacco companies knew if they dragged their feet, um, they would pay less overall and could come up with a different plan. In the case of U.S. tobacco growers, they just started exporting once they got, uh, you know, sort of beaten up uh, by Jeff Nesbitt and a bunch of other people who ended up finding them, but they had planned it all. It was all money they had in the bank. It was not going to kill them, and they knew it because they'd done the same thing. And a more obscure example, and I find hilarious, just because I love researching these things, is seatbelts. If you can imagine... Uh, the auto industry fought seatbelts for decades. They were around for a really long time. They spent the equivalent of I don't know what talking about how dangerous they were and how much expense it would be to buy a car if you had a seatbelt and now they sell safety. But it was all planned and part of a delayed action, um, you know, working in the halls of Congress, working in legislatures and uh, with ministers around the world, not just the United States. And now we know um, that's true for climate change too. And they are, the they're gonna make money eventually, they will, but they're making it, they've calculated how long they have to drag their feet. And in the end, they'll pay very little and they will um, get with the program. But it's not, it's calculated. It's incredibly calculated. And I know this because I walk my, dogs with my friends who talk about what they're doing. And so we know what's going on. So corporations are one of our, should be our targets uh, and, and really understanding how they spend their money behind the scenes and in the halls of Congress or around the world. It is no different in India, Great Britain, Zambia, and everywhere. It is the same story because I travel, I meet with people and I'm in 192 countries, my organization doing the same thing. And then we look to other relevant partners. And I'm going to start with Google. For the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, and by the way, 
the people who run Google are people we all know. They work for Obama. Um, they work for progressive causes. They've moved over. Maybe they're working in sustainability, but they're there. These are people we can get in a car if you're in California or call them up and go meet with them, but we don't. And collectively, we knew that because we need to do that because, for example, I asked Google for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day to change their algorithms around climate change. And they said in writing, no, we're not going to do that. However, they also said we are going to change our air pollution um, algorithms because we will be able to um, put straight up air pollution stats in front of people that'll come up first in the searches. So I asked them, well, well, why can't you do it for climate change? And they just never gave me a real answer. And they did it for COVID-19. As you know, misinformation was flying around. And so Google and some of the other big search engines got it together and mm -hmm. started sending people, regardless of what they asked, uh, to the CDC. It can be done. We just have to ask them. And when they won't do it, then we have to ask them a little more loudly. And we have to continue to do that with all of these big search engines because they're part of the problem. And of course, we already touched on media um, and they can do the same thing. Uh, media does us a great favor, but we also have to be in the patch, local papers. We have to go to the ground and find local papers rather than the New York Times or Huffington Post and actually get into local papers um, and talk to people because that's uh, where they get their news other than say Fox in the United States. And of course the wild wild west of social media, again, those algorithms can be changed. Uh, we talk to them, Earth Day Networks talks to Instagram and Facebook and Twitter all the time. And these are really good people that if we did it together, um, and again, uh, search engines around the world, but they dominate, um, we need to put that effort in. Uh, many people, as you know, can't tell the difference between real and fake news online. Half the time, I can't. There's a recent study from Brown that found that um, 25 to 30 percent of all tweets on Twitter are from bots, and they're even higher for science-related tweets, and they are responsible for close to 40 percent of tweets about fake science. So these are things that search engines, big companies with great people running them, um, who need to feel the pressure from all of us um, to do the right thing, because they can do the right thing. We know they can. We've seen it. We know these are just people. These are not machines or things. Algorithms are not things floating around in space that we can't control. They are real. Um, and I think, as everybody said, you know, the disinformation under the right conditions turns to intimidation. And there's a widening gap between um, what people believe in science and, um, and the scientists themselves. And intimidation leads to distrust, as I said. And uh, we've been looking at a lot of, uh, of how scientists feel about their own work. And now we find that almost just about fewer than 50% of scientists feel that this is a good time for science. And whether people believe um, uh, in their work is going down. And this is not in the United States. This is globally that both people and scientists feel that science is either being directly discredited or that people just don't care about it. So it's not a good time for science and it's not a good time to stay in a comfort zone with all of us um, talking to ourselves. It is, as I said before, it's incredibly hard work to get to them. Um, just on sort of what we can do, um, as I said, pressure on people who own these big companies, um, switching out of our comfort zone and instead of having environmental groups talking about how you solve the problem, getting trusted leaders of groups maybe we're not comfortable with. Um, these can be people who run pesticide companies, believe it or not, or evangelical leaders uh, or citizen scientists. Um, and I think a couple of people said it, I think Layla particularly, the theme for Earth Day 2020 is restoration. It's a positive message. It goes to the exact same thing we were talking about, Layla particularly about what it is, the technology, um, using natural systems. And I think we need to more and more switch over our conversation to one focused on how we can um, sort of re restore the planet. Um, and uh, lastly, I think um, we need to, Shamila said this and I completely agree, and Earth Day Network's been focused on climate and environmental literacy forever. Um, and our goal is to have every country adopt mandatory climate environmental literacy tied to civic engagement. 
In other words, no country on earth, and we did a World Bank study, and unfortunately, the state of environmental education is horrendous, give or take a couple countries and California, but none of it is tied to civic engagement. And until we teach people um, that they can do something about what they're learning um, and it's value driven, we are never going to change uh, people's opinion. We've had multiple generations since the first Earth Day and um, we don't have decent environmental education. So we're hoping by the next COP, we have about half a dozen countries, um, Italy, Mexico, uh, Nigeria, Nicaragua, uh, that are willing to go to the COP the next time and say, we need an official agreement on climate and environmental um, education. So with that note, I'll turn it back to all of you. Um, and certainly, um, I'm open to any questions you have about my um, opinions. Uh, thank you very much, Kathleen. Really, a lesson of advices and experience and political brains and uh, wow. I used to, um, it's a long time I don't go to Washington. I used to go quite often in a period. And yeah, all this lobbying world and realities and it's, uh, well, learning things and 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 this that uh, there's good people everywhere. They just need to be. To, we need to put pressure on them. You know, at the end, they are human beings, despite uh, being controlling the world communication. Okay, we have some questions now, and at the same time, we've been with so much enthusiasm that uh, we should have finished already, but we did. So. Um, I had a one one uh, question for Astrid hmm? uh, <clears throat> about the. I mean, one of the uh, objectives of the Union of Concerned Scientists, no, and I quote, is to fight back when powerful corporations or special interests mislead the public on science. Hmm? How does this statement fit into the broader context on? climate change disinformation and why are there these special interests groups so powerful if it's clear but please we said before like four minutes now if we could use two would be great <laughs> um, i'll try to keep my time yes so i'm just going to start by saying something very important that uh, the issue of disinformation and misinformation is not only a basic issue of ethics, but also an issue of justice, right? By misleading people uh, and not giving them the information, big oil and politicians deny them the most basic right, which is the right to the truth, to live healthy lives and to have equal rights to it. If we add to it the inequalities of the climate change impact where communities are, some communities are disproportionately affected, particularly those that are disenfranchised historically or those that are disadvantaged, uh, the situation is definitely very concerned. So in the past, we have seen lots of instances where science was ignored and manipulated, but today we're seeing really a concerted effort to that. And uh, science on pollutants, toxins, carcinogens are all being pushed aside, dismissed, doubted in recent years. And the general science denial in environmental and public health policymaker um, is creating a lot of confusion for the public. Uh, so that is a, pro a, a issue that the UCS, my organization, addresses from a variety of angles, from detection to action, and from the community to the federal level, because um, the general confusion created by these special interests is really extremely pervasive and pernicious. So, uh, of course, big oil, big coal, all these, uh, all these uh, organizations, corporations, and their lobbying money is what is bringing all that. And UCS is at, on top of it. We have published the deception dossiers um, of, in 2015, excuse me, in 2015, where we really list who was responsible for doing what, who did what. And we also published a peer-reviewed paper uh, really attributing uh, more than 50% of uh, global warming uh, to, to these uh, 
90 main uh, oil companies and about 30% of sea level rise can be also attributed not only to the extraction, but to the burning of these fossil fuels. So uh, we, have, we have been really going after this, um, this, uh, this information purveyors and um, we, really, we really have to hold them accountable. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Caldas. Uh, just that you know, it looks like you know, there are a couple of you know, audience questions, and one of the questions is, is directed to Dave. So I'm asking my colleague, uh, Melissa, to, to read that question out uh, for, for Dave to respond. And Dave, you've got about you know, two to three minutes to respond to that question. Melissa, please ask uh, Dave that question. Okay, so we have an interesting question from um, Yah Yadhav Balawu for Dr. Niyogi pertaining to the pertaining to implementing the tools or universal pilots. To what extent can they be feasible in terms of practice when we take into consideration how some countries are becoming more conservative pertaining to their sovereignty and foreign policies? Dr. Niyogi. Yep. Um, that's an interesting question. I sort of uh, aligns with uh, what we heard from, say, the previous two panelists regarding either the story machine or the lobbies that are out there and also what Astrid mentioned about this whole uh, range of interest. I think that is true. At one end, we have very strong vested interest, whether it is at a national level or corporate level. But at the same time, we also have what we heard is individuals and organizations that can do something. I think when we are talking about tools or portals, our experience has been that we need to find a change of conversation. And we have to find at least some common point. And one common point when we were working with some extremely uh, conservative groups was that, as I mentioned, while climate change may have differences in the nuances, everyone experiences and understand climate variability. That, you know, previous years were colder, this year is warmer, next year might be warmer or cooler, and climate variability, that we could agree on. Going from that, what we started with organizations is that if we can develop tools or solutions for climate variability, we may be opening a door to start working on climate change. That became one premise by which we started working with some say the agriculture and so forth. The second one that we had to say that in the broader context, climate change cannot be treated as a culprit. That if you tackle climate change, it is actually tied in with economic growth. There is economic and sustainable aspects built into it. And so the culprit here is not climate change. It is a lack of tools, lack of resources, and lack of information, how to really adapt to it and how to mitigate it and work with it. So when some of these dialogues start emerging, then there are some common core aspects that come up. And so for example, when we are talking about uh, the, the tools and portals, uh, we have been working, as I mentioned, through UNESCO on the monsoon school, which has been a great example where you know, some people might come at it in the context as the example was given for Hurricane Sandy, that this is completely climate driven or this is completely anything but climate driven but yet we could find some experiential ways to find how this is all interlinked and come up with solutions so i would say again to summarize one is change the conversation find a common ground and come up with examples where solutions can emerge and become profitable to everyone if you start with that opening perhaps there is a potential that this can be scaled up to something much more bigger Thank you. Thank you. So clear. No? That's why you're a professor also. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this capacity <laughs> to tell us things in a very clear way. I have a, a question for Leila again. So then I don't know if you managed to go back to sleep or, or you just go on. But uh, <laughs> I think I'm going to be awake from now on. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, one of those is, uh, uh, has to do with uh, when you go into the 
making the, the film, no? Uh, how do you verify it? Um, and the information that's going to be used, I mean, uh, how do you make sure that uh, it's relevant, it's important, and is accurate? Um, well, we basically work with scientists and we work with, uh, we've been in the space for a while, I mean, 20 years. So what we've learned, and this is another idea I think that works, is the idea of persistence. So we're aware of the Union of Concerned Scientists. We're aware of NOAA. We're aware of NASA. We're aware of, you know, the, some of the scientists that have a bigger names in the business, you know, uh, like James Hansen and, again, Michael Mann. And then, you know, so we, we work with institutions, right, that for a long time. So one can see truth is very persistent. And that's the other we really do have truth on our side here. And it really can't hold back the reality of things. And uh, I know I'm straying from your question, but basically uh, that's how we know what to do because we do listen to the science and we have relationships with them and, and rely on them. Uh, and also we go to where things are actually happening. Like for, you know, with Ice on Fire, we went to see where they measure the CO2 up in the Rocky Mountains. And it was funny because I don't think I've ever seen that anywhere else. And it also, to, to fault my, my own storytelling, why didn't I do that sooner? Because I thought it was very effective to see that there's actually a way that this is measured and it's measured all over the world every week. So, you know, things like that are what we do. We go and actually see it with our own eyes rather than rely on intermediaries. And that's something, you know, we do not rely on intermediaries. Uh, but I would back to just quickly, I would like to say with truth and persistence, you know, it's very, it takes a lot of money to maintain a falsehood. And also, I think with COVID-19, we are seeing Mother Nature uh, or wherever it came from, you know, whatever. Uh, but the point is, this is a natural phenomenon that cannot be denied, even though they're doing a very good job trying to deny it with their numbers or whatever is going on. It's just going to make its, itself known. And so the problem with climate is we know that when it's, it makes itself known, it might be a little too late. So that's the biggest problem with climate. Yeah. But uh, on our side, we just have to be persistent and depend on science. Good, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leila. Uh, there would be a further question, but this is for, for Kathleen, regarding the, um, I mean, if, if we are not wrong, the Earth Day organization has a science uh, education programs for children and college students. Mm -hmm. We would like to know eventually if it's possible and briefly more in, 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 in detail if, uh, how you care about the regional differences on doing this, on, on shaping this, uh, this education programs. And uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, when we did the World Bank study, we, uh, this was global and uh, partially paid by the World Bank by some other people. And what we discovered was, um, as the question uh, proposes, is that there are regional differences. So if you're in India and you have climate and environmental education materials on the books, let's say, in the curricula, um, it, it quite often is uh, driven by a teacher's interests uh, by because they don't have no country has graduation requirements for climate and environmental literacy or civics in other words you can graduate from high school in the United States or any country mm -hmm. and not really understand how to protect yourself from a local environmental problem or what are the routes you take to contact your um, local leaders uh, what are your rights as citizen around community right to know and so mm -hmm. um, in addition, so we have two problems. Um, one is, regardless of what's on the books in the curricula, countries teach it and teachers and states inside countries teach it differently. In the United States, we're now becoming famous, but we're not the only country um, where you have certain states of our 50 that have taken the word climate change out of their science books, literally not redacted it, but actually had publishers publish it without uh, the word climate change in it at all. They cannot mention climate change in their classroom in multiple states in the United States. Then you have other states in Brazil or India 
Great Britain, every country, Finland, one of the greatest educators in the world does not have mandatory climate environmental literacy. And again, nobody connects it to a, what you can do. And so as a person, as a lawyer and a litigator and, and a policy person, I know you have to attack it two ways. One is it's gotta be mandatory. It has to be mandatory at the national level. And in many countries, uh, including the United States, a lot of it's driven, controlled, budgeted, by the state itself. And in some states within it, there are counties or municipal governments that have their own control. New York City is one of the few places where they control the education agenda inside New York State. So every region around the world, and again, I keep using the United States, but our study was global and I, that is pretty consistent. Um, and I think the last point, which is not really the question, but, um, it has to, civic engagement um, tools that you're given also has to be tied to voting. And you're understanding that if you care about climate change and if you've learned about climate change or any environmental issue, because there are many um, that are of great concern, including environmental justice issues, which are not taught in schools either. In other words, people don't really understand that it's, even if they don't see it themselves, it's going on a couple blocks away or a mile away in some poor community. And I find it interesting that poor people are less likely to believe in science, even though they are subjected regularly to incredible environmental injustices, but it's true. And so I think you have to actually take the step, which is very, it's not partisan. It's a, it's a, it's a right that many, many countries enjoy is to connect your information um, and civic tools to um, the most basic of things, which is voting. And on the youth thing, uh, no matter how we cut it, and youth groups were very supportive of youth climate groups. But in 2018, which was our off year elections, but we found this in Brazil and a bunch of other countries, Australia, 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 um, that young people were either not voting at all, despite the frightening prospects of a world enveloped in a climate crisis. They were you know, voting in even lower numbers um, than we predicted. So maybe in the United States, Australia, other places, even where they have compulsory voting, in the United States, we had like less than 30% of people under a certain age, youth voters, voting. So it's a very difficult situation. But if you don't connect education to civic engagement tools to your whatever constitutional or other rights you have, um, then we're not taking a holistic approach to the entire problem. Mm. Sorry. Long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you very much, Catherine. Donald, if you want. Yes, so thank you very much, everyone. Uh, uh, in fact, you know, we have got seven more questions you know, that we have received, or uh, maybe slightly more than that, you know, from, from the audience, you know, which needed to be, uh, to be dealt with. But unfortunately, we have almost you know, run out of time. What we will do is in the next step of the sure of uh, this webinar, we will start the webinar by first by answering uh, those, those questions. So this has been a very engaging session, perhaps uh, this one and a half hours or slightly more than that, uh, about two hours, we simply managed to scratch the surface of the context of climate change disinformation. Much more is, is still you know, left to be discussed. And in the next webinar, we will take a closer look at demand side solutions uh, to this phenomenon, uh, which is uh, becoming um, uh, a bit, uh, a complex as well as in you know, a very, uh, very, very uh, difficult for us to deal with. So with this, uh, we conclude this afternoon's session on climate change disinformation. Please remember to refer to our event web page uh, uh, and the links. And thank you so much panelists. You know, you are very, very, very engaging at the same time and very informative to everyone. So we look forward to see you in the next uh, episode of our webinar. That is on 17, exactly at 2, 2, 2 p.m., exactly uh, as, as we started uh, uh, the webinar today. So thank you so much, and bye-bye. Um, and, and good morning still, and good afternoon at many places. Thank, thank you. Evening. Thank you very much. Bye. It's been really a pleasure being together. <laughs> right. Goodbye. Absolutely. Yeah, to do pain, to do joy, yeah? To do <laughs> Adeus. Adeus. Ciao.